everything affects everything, sort of. So the way we, yeah. you know, might gate a kick drum changes the way we compress it, and the way we compress it changes how we would EQ it. And like, we want to help you get an understanding for that, and not view the individual plugins or parts of the chain as sort of individual things to do, but it all goes together. And what you're doing at the end of the day is you're creating a kick drum sound that works in the context of the mix, has the energy you want, serves the song, and there's multiple things that you can do to achieve that, and they all kind of go together. This is the Self-Recording Band Podcast, the show where we help you make exciting records on your own, wherever you are, DIY style. Let's go. Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Tyne. If you are new to the show, welcome. So glad to have you. If you're already a listener, welcome back. So stoked that you're still with us and joining us for this, what is it, two, episode 207, kind of crazy. So thank you for being a loyal listener. Today, we've got something prepared for you that's going to be a two-parter, probably. So uh, we're going in-depth on one specific topic which some of you have appreciated us doing before, and so we do it again. It's about mixing kick drums, or like processing kick drums in a mix, I should say. I never like really saying mixing kick drums because we mix songs, right? So we're going to talk about pro how to process a kick drum in a mix, what we do to make it work, to make the low end work, to make the kick drum work in the context of the music. And this is available on all podcast apps as always, but it's also on YouTube in video version if you want to watch it. And as always, I'm here with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood. Hello, Malcolm. How are you? Hey, Benny. I'm great, man. It's great to see you. How are you doing? I'm doing good as well. Thank you. Preparing for the Fantastic. US trip right now. I'm going to leave tomorrow. So by the time you hear this episode, I'm already over there. Lots to yeah. plan and pack and whatever, like a three-week three, three week, uh, trip. Uh, it's always tricky with, you know, what to take and what, what to leave at home and stuff. And then, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's exciting, though. Totally. Are, are you, you can tell the listeners what you're doing over there, yeah, right? Yeah, I'm going to go to NAMM, first of all. So I'm going to have like one or two... Um, two or three off days, I think, in LA. Then I'm going to go to NAM over the weekend, hopefully well rested and not jet lagged anymore. There's going to be a ton of like people to meet. And so I've got a full schedule already with people that I want to hang out with and that have invited me to hang out with them. It's going to be awesome. Going to be at NAM. So looking forward to that. And then after NAM, again, two days or so to decompress and maybe have lunch with a few people to talk about that, all the things that happened. And then I'm going to fly to. Arkansas, Rogers, Arkansas, a town in the sort of middle of the US, sort of. And I'm going to produce a record there, which is really, really exciting. Haven't done that in a while, at least not a full record. I've done parts of records. And like the last full production I did is like two years, three years ago at this point. But this time we're doing it all session musicians, um, the artists recording themselves, of course. Then, you know, there's a whole team and, and you know, whole, you know, all the things Heck that yeah. happen. And I will do my yeah. best to document it all. I will obviously be focused on the session more than anything. But whenever there's breaks or after the session or whenever I can do it without being distracted, I will try and capture as much of it as possible uh, and share those insights with you because it's going to be really amazing. I'm looking forward to it. I'm bringing a little bit of gear, which makes the whole planning challenging as well as so I'm bringing like a small interface and a preamp and a bunch of microphones. And yeah, it's going to be really cool. And then I fly back to LA and then back home in three weeks. That's awesome. Yeah. Very exciting trip. I am sad that I don't get to see you yeah, this time. Me too. That you're coming over here, but <laughs> next time. Man. Next time, man. Yeah, we'll, it <laughs> will happen time, again. Yeah. At the, at the yeah, latest, and, then, you know, Hamburg in fall, I guess. So, yeah, yeah. yeah hopefully before hopefully that. Before that. I'm confident something will come up before yes, then. Totally. Um, yeah. One of the the main companies like that I use. Well, it's, it's sure everybody knows the company. Sure, actually, I guess in the music industry, um, but I use them for my wireless stuff and TV work. And they've like teased an announcement at Nam on the twenty fourth, oh, really? and I'm like, I think I know what it is, and I really want it, so I'm super excited. Ah. <laughs> so, it, but is it is but, it like t TV sound specific or remote like location? Yes, it recording? is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, well, no, actually, that's not true. Bands could use it too mm. in live situations. They would told to use it. So okay. We'll, we'll, we'll circle back to this. It's a teaser. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> well, I, I I don't even know how much of it I can really check out over there because it's just so much. It's impossible to be at all the booths at all times for, for all the yeah, events and announcements. So much like, going on. Planning this trip is, is like really crazy. But yeah, it's, I'll do my best and then give you all the updates. <laughs> Uh, you, you don't have to swing by there, buddy. No, no. They'll, they'll email me. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure. no. I, will, I definitely won't check out any of that stuff if it's not really relevant for us. But anything I can, you know, 
anything I can I hear. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of, like as always, there's going to be lots of announcements and cool things. To yeah, you're going to find some cool gear that is relevant to our audience for sure while you're Definitely. there. So much cool stuff gets announced over there. Absolutely. And everyone's going to be there. That's so cool too. Like all the entire industry, except for Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm skipping. Yeah, I'm skipping, exactly. <laughs> Very cool. Good. All right. So, yeah, other than that, like, Malcolm, what what does your, you know, spring and everything look like? TV stuff or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's there's lots of TV. I mean, there's two shows that I'm not allowed to mention yet, but I'm excited about them. Um, and then, uh, I mean, just most, most recently, uh, I don't want to get too far into it because we, we got to get to today's episode, yeah. but I did just do a bunch of stuff with um, Sportsnet, which like handles the Hockey Day in Canada stuff, um, which oh, is a big that. deal. Over I saw here. the post. Canada's yeah. a... It, I, I think everybody's probably aware that hockey is a really big deal in Canada. Yep. <laughs> like, we're pretty into it. <laughs> pretty <nice. laughs> and I am pretty not into it. I mean, actually, I love hockey. I think it's super fun. Uh, I love going to games and watching it, but I don't keep up with it at all. Mm -hmm. So I'm meeting like full on legends and I have no idea who they are. And they're like, <laughs> all right, go, Mike, Kevin Bieksa. And I'm like, who? <laughs> So like, I don't know which one of these guys is Kevin. <laughs> that's, and, that's so funny. And they're like, oh, really? So that was funny. But but it was a super cool gig. Got to see the Stanley Cup and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it was a fun one for any hockey fans out there. Oh, right. That's awesome. Like Yeah. So that story that I saw yesterday, was that the Stanley Cup that you're standing next to? Yes, ah, it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is that something like you're aware of the Stanley yeah, Cup I, over I, in Germany? Does I, that yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's yeah, actually cool. pretty. There's a lot of people into hockey here as well. The thing is, for the German listeners, we don't call it like hockey is a different thing here. Hockey is like field hockey for us, like the summer thing, and and oh. hockey. So hockey is a different thing. We call it like ice hockey, is what you call oh, hockey. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's that. That's fair. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we 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 only differentiate by calling it field hockey yeah, usually. Exactly. Yeah. But I think you're right. We should be going ice hockey and field hockey. Uh, that makes more yeah. sense. Yeah. As usual. Yeah, I mean, but we, we Germans are yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> but we, we skip the field though in hockey, so we call it hockey. Oh, and we you have okay. ice hockey and hockey, and you have field hockey and hockey. So yeah, <laughs> two different hockey. Right. Anyway, people know what you're talking what you're talking about. So yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, I saw totally. that post yesterday, that story, and that was awesome. Had no idea how huge this, this thing is, by the way. <laughs> you're standing next yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah. Tons of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Tons of, yeah, it was good good fun. Awesome, man. Awesome. Good fun indeed. Really good to hear. Well, great. Then let's get into today's episode. Yeah. Kick drums. Kick drums. So what we're going to do is we're going to wing it today. I'm going to be fully transparent here because there is, we've mixed so many songs and all of them basically, you know, have kick drums in them or like 99% of them probably, probably. So I guess we, mm -hmm. we really know what we are, we're talking about here and what we do typically. And the reason why this is not as, we were talking about whether to do, whether we would do a EQ episode and a compression episode or whatever, but we actually decided to do a general kick drum processing episode or two of those because everything affects everything sort of so the way we yeah. you know might gate the kick drum changes the way we compress it and the way we compress it changes how we would eq it and like we want to help you get an understanding for that and not view the individual plugins or parts of the chain as sort of individual things to do but it all goes together and what you're doing at the end of the day is you're creating a kick drum sound that works in the context of the mix has the energy you want serves the song and there's multiple things that you can do to achieve that, and they all kind of go together. So that's why we do it. And we're just going to talk yeah. about our chains, I guess, and typical approaches. And maybe we have like, I don't know, two or three different things for different genres. But honestly, across all kinds of genres that I mix, the things I do to a kick drum are relatively similar. I might address different frequency areas or I might, you know, use a certain parameter on a compressor slightly differently, but the th general thought process or what I'm trying to achieve is kind of the same. I don't know about you, Malcolm, but it's not that I'm, I'm, I'm having, I'm creating a completely different kick drum chain every single time. It's usually my go-to things that I use to varying degrees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I mean, like the sample world is where the yep. biggest difference would be uh, from if I went to like a softer, more acoustic genre, of course. But um, but overall, yeah, the processing does stay the same. But I, I do want to reinforce what Benny was just saying in that the, like we're doing this because context is everything. And I think that's an important takeaway just for all mixing education you consume anywhere, including our own on this podcast or on YouTube, is that like if you watch a video that's just like how to mix the perfect kick drum, it doesn't matter unless you hear the whole mix with it and they mix the rest of the song 
into that as well. It, like it's always got to be done holistically, and you know you can spend all the time you want on that kick in mic and get it sounding massive, but then you throw your overheads in and it's a totally different game. So really, always keep that in mind. It's not that there's not value in these kind of specific techniques that sound good soloed but just you have to also know what's going to happen when it's not in solo anymore yes so really really important to just keep that in mind whenever you're learning anything about mixing on any instrument any mic yeah 100 percent. so there's actually different levels or sort of yeah levels of, of context there it's the the kick and the context of the entire kit like the the drum kit so when you turn on the yeah. overheads in rooms that has changed how the kick drum sounds it's not just the close mic then there might be multiple close mics that you have to blend first. Then, then yeah. there is the context of the song. So the kick drum on its own might sound exciting or cool or whatever, but that doesn't mean it works for the song. And yeah, all, and then and then there's things. And like, then there's yeah, the, yeah, yeah, like the context of just the frequency band. Yeah. You know, it's like the low yeah. end summed of the the rest of the instruments. Yeah. You know, sometimes you throw in that bass guitar and your kick drum just falls apart and you're like, why? Yeah. <laughs> but it yeah. does. Uh, and sometimes it could be the guitars, even though they're out to the sides. Yeah. It's like still all affects, everything affects yeah. everything. And then the beat as a whole as well, like the groove of the song. So mm-hmm. not just how yes. the mics influence the kick drum sound, but how, how does the kick feel in sort of relation to the snare drum? So do the two, the, you know, the downbeats and the backbeat, does that work together? And is there any other percussive yeah. element that is part of that too? So there's all kinds of things. And and it's not that we think about it all the time. It's more a feel thing, right? You li- You learn how to listen for certain things and you just pay attention to how the groove feels basically. And, and but these are all things that are part of that. So never look in, like you said, yeah. Malcolm, never look into any of these things in isolation, you always view the song as a whole. Especially with kick drums, I feel like there's they carry so much of the energy of a song and so much of the emotion, the vibe, the how aggressive it is and all that. It's so important. Like it changes the entire mm-hmm. song basically. It's like there's so much in the kick drum. And so yeah. Uh, yeah, people love kick drums for a reason. They get you moving, right? Yeah. People people really resonate with it. And you know, this could be another cool takeaway because I think people are usually pretty impressed with how quick professional mixers move if they're watching them mix something. Like they, you know, pull up an EQ, a couple tweaks, bam, they're on to the next thing in the chain or somewhere else in the song entirely. And that is less to do, I think, with them being like, I just nailed it, the kick drum's perfect, and more with them knowing as professionals that they're going to be right back in a minute to go look at that kick drum as soon as they change something else and it makes them unhappy with the yeah. kick drum. We're, we're not very precious as we're mixing because we know that the context is going to change as we unmute things and as we change other things. So we're always constantly going back and modifying our work. So yeah, it's holistic. And we're not precious with the decisions we're making. These are kind of our first moves. Yes, totally. However, I'm. I want to say though, it's maybe it's a little different for me here because I try to avoid that as much as possible. The whole going back and undoing things. So I, you're right. I, I'm not afraid to do it, and I will absolutely. I'm not precious about anything um, in this uh, regard. But I tend to avoid doing too much in solo, for example, only to then have to undo a bunch of things later. So I try to always move forward. That's that's a general thing for me in mixing is I make a decision and it's the decision's been made, I move forward and I basically almost never look back. It's really like that at this point. So I make my decisions in context from the beginning and yeah, it's very rare that I have to go back. So it sometimes happens, but it's actually pretty rare. But this is just because I don't start with okay, let's listen to the kick drum and then let's listen to the other thing and then I bring up other stuff and then it changes. Yes. But I listen to the song you as a whole. You are listening to comments, And then, yeah. yeah. But so that's different for everybody. Just to still totally write what you said there. Uh, don't be afraid to change it if the context changes. Of course. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This Especially, I think this is very valuable advice for DIY musicians because we often mix as we record or we, you know, we write and then do pre-pro and before we know it, we're already in the recording session and then it's also partly mixed. So sometimes the whole process gets kind of this one always evolving session sort of. And especially there, the context will definitely change and then you might have to go back and change things. For me, maybe it's a little different because I always get the final multi-tracks. I can only focus on the mix and that there's not much going, you know, much changing, right. the changes going on. But as soon as you add something to the arrangement or you decide to re-record something or whatever, context definitely changes. And so I think it's yeah. absolutely important. It, yeah, It's usually not necessarily a change for me either. But it, I mean, it certainly is. Sometimes I go way too big on the low end on a kick drum, for example. Just be like, hey, there's nothing but room when it's soloed. Let's just go huge. And then 
you know, what's the, everything's happening. It's like, okay, it's a little, little much. So sometimes that happens, but more likely as the mix starts coming together, I might be like, you know, I need to saturate that kick drum mm-hmm. or something just to get it a little denser or, or, yes. or clip it or something, you know, just like, so it's like additive totally. steps that are tweaking it, you know, it's like, Agreed. okay, I got it where I thought it needed to be. But it turns out we can push it further. Oh, that's yeah. kind of the Oh, I do that all the time. The totally get it. Like that's yeah. the, I will constantly add things during the mix. It's just that I rarely undo things that I've done. I like go back and then, you know, it, the decision's yeah. been made for a reason and I just move on. Otherwise I wouldn't have made it. But but I definitely keep adding things. It's not that I'm done with the kick drum and then mix the rest and t- don't touch the kick drum again. No, not at all. Like I might uh-huh. yeah. it might be the very last thing that I do again for whatever reason, but it's usually just at, like you said boosting a little more than I thought or adding a little extra thing there or like things like that. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Great, great, yeah. great note. Cool. So what is the, let's start with the first thing you typically do to a kick drum because this is already different between the two of us, I guess. So what do you do first? So I, for a while now, have been using gates on my kick drums a lot. Mm-hmm. I find that they, I mean, there's often a lot of information I don't need between kick it so i'm happy to remove all that generally some you know some instruments bleed can be uh, a nice thing but with kick drums i tend to not enjoy any of that stuff um not that it's overly loud either on a kick drum generally that bleed is pretty quiet but i suck that out and then but the main reason i'm using a gate is actually to shape the kick drum because you have total control over the the decay uh and like it's sustain of the drum when you're using a gate that you have, I mean, that's, we won't get into it, but I control my gates with key spikes, which let me totally tailor them super accurately. But yep. <laughs> that's another, another topic entirely. But just know that I use a gate and then I shape the drum either shorter or, or change the curve of its decay to kind of make the groove of the song. Like, like Benny was talking about, find that relation of the kick drum and the snare, the, the backbeat. And make make a groove that and shape the sustain of the kick drum to fit what I want to happen in that groove. That's like my very first move for a while. Okay, great. So I I actually want to achieve the same thing. I just do it a little differently. So I sometimes use gates, and if I do, I I also trigger them with in my case not audio key spikes, but MIDI, which but for the same reason. Mm-hmm. So I use MIDI gates, to, and I I love the control over you know when it actually opens. And and I, I want to avoid like any sort of miss triggers or like miss you know opens where it shouldn't open and stuff like that. So uh, I'd like to do that as well sometimes. But for the most part, I control the shape of it and the sustain by using a transient designer rather than or some sort of envelope shaper rather than a gate. I feel like that gets me the same thing. I don't know. I just like what I can do with that. I don't know. So. The the thing is, a nice side effect of a transient shaper is actually that when you reduce, especially when you're making it shorter, so when you reduce the sustain of the kick drum, when you shorten that, the bleed kind of goes away as well. It it almost sounds like a little bit of gating or expansion or something when I when you yeah, do that. Totally. So I'm I'm doing a similar thing just with a different tool. And sometimes the gate is the answer. But again, the how is not as important as the why. We both try to make sure that the the kick is not way too long for the tempo and feel of the song. We try to make sure that the low end feels right because I feel like shorter kick drums feel tighter and like harder in a way and longer kick drums have more of this pillowy, longer, softer low end in a way, oftentimes at least, so I can Mm. shape that. And then there's only so much space in terms of tempo and then depending on what the bass guitar does and all that stuff. So that's also the thing that I start with. I want to make sure that the source that I have fits well in within like the context of the song and the low end and and tweaking the sustain of it and, and sometimes the attack also is a good starting point for me for sure yeah yeah this is like actually it, it sounds minor i think to people listening that haven't messed with doing this but it's actually probably like the most creative step in my kick drum sound maybe aside from choosing samples if it's going to be a sample heavy mix but like you can make it go from just a totally normal natural sounding kick drum to like an 808 with a gate you can really make it sound like a totally different drum and totally transform it. So it's actually a really creative step in the process. So don't sleep on it. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Just as to also make it clear, we assume that you have a great source already in this episode. So we're not going to get into mm-hmm. choosing the kick drum at the samples and all that. So it might be just a natural kick drum, might be all samples, might be anything in between. What's very important is that the source has to be right. So whether you achieve that through 
sample layering or replacement or programming or organic drums doesn't matter yep. but we assume now that before you go into before into before you do what we are about to talk uh, here before you do that you got to make sure that the the source is right and that the kick drum is actually a good choice for the song because if that's not the case everything we're now talking about is is not really relevant uh, relevant so yeah. yeah yeah and really good point benny i i i was kind of talking as if i was only referring to live drums but i do the exact same yeah. thing if i get um, like if i've got a electronic kit that's been printed into audio i'm still shaping the yeah. kick drum the exact same it, way even though there's no yeah. bleed on that so often it's just a you know an electronic drum kit like Printed the audio file, they MIDI the audio, and it and they if they sent it without bleed, I'm still going to shape it. Yeah, exactly. Great, cool. So next step, so I might do, I, I do that one first, and then I'll let you do the next one again. Maybe it's the same, maybe it's different. So after the shaping okay. of the sustain, what I'll typically do is so the first. <laughs> Actually, another thing I just have to say that I assume you do this before you even dive into kick mixing. So what's essential to me is that before all of that, I created a kind of a balance already, like a rough mix that I like. So I already mm -hmm. know what my kick sounds like combined with the overheads and the rooms and all of that. So yes. this is one thing. So the balance is sort of there already. So that gives me a lot of info about... So I listen to this rough mix, I create my balance. That tells me a lot about the song. So by doing that rough mix first, I know, oh, well, this kick drum... It's nice, but it sounds a little boxy and cheap, or it doesn't cut through for whatever reason. I have to turn it up really loud for it to be audible. So I, I, I get these cues, and I know about some of the problems I'm having with the raw kick. I just you know, get these by just doing the rough mix and trying to find the balance. And so now I use this information for my next step, which is typically a cleanup process, where I might remove some... In, in most cases, I will remove some of the mid-range, which is oftentimes a cardboardy boxy kind of cheap sound it, it the, the exact frequency mm -hmm. is different from time to time but anywhere between 200 and or 300 and 700 800 somewhere there in the mid-range is, is is usually something i don't really like about the kick unless it's like a really lo-fi on purpose like dirty thing but in most cases there's something that i can can subtract that subtract there and then i will listen for an unpleasant, and I haven't seen many people do that actually, but I personally also listen for an unpleasant quality in the beater attack because there's the good click sound sort of, the good attack that will cut through the mix, yeah. but then oftentimes there's also an annoying kind of thing that I don't really want or that also can sound cheap. So I sometimes, if that's the case, I find that and notch it out, which makes it just a little more pleasing sounding. I don't know if you mean if you know what I'm talking about here, but sometimes there's a 4K or exactly, whatever, like yeah. very narrow point on the kick drum that I don't really like, and I will try and find that and smooth it out a little bit, and then I like a broader boost to the entire upper mid-range or whatever. That sounds better to me often. So if that's yeah. the case, I might clean that up. And then I will also clean up the low end, meaning that... I, based on the context of the song and whatever the bass guitar is doing, the key, the tuning of the, the song and all of that, I might be like, okay, I want a very sub-heavy kick drum with like a lot of energy at 40, 50 hertz or something, or 60 hertz, or I want a kick drum that has more of a knock and less of the subs, and then I go more for the 100 or whatever, that is like tighter, more of that knock punch kind of thing. And that means I might you know, carve out one or the other and focus. I, in general, I will focus the kick drum low end on one of those two areas. It's either the focus is on like the 60, 50, whatever the fundamental of that kick drum is. You see it on Analyzer pretty pretty easily. So whatever that fundamental mm -hmm. is, I might either focus on that or I will focus basically an octave up on the 100 or something like that and, and leave the low end a little thinner, um, like the subs. And so this is the second part of the cleanup process. And I oftentimes will then, you know, take out... 5 dBs or something at 100 or 150, or, you know, it, totally context dependent, but I would absolutely have a look at the low end and decide what my focus is going to be on and whether or not it's getting in the way of other things and just, you know, clean things up there. I don't want the kick drum, that's what I'm saying, I don't want the kick drum to usually to cover everything from like 20 to 150, usually not. So usually there's something I, I get rid of in order to make space for other things and, it, and also in order to right. focus the low end better on the kick drum itself. Yeah. Yeah. I would say I'm pretty similar there. E kick drum is like the one thing that almost every time at least has like a low, mid, high EQ like move on it. Like it's like the 
you need those three bands to all get looked at pretty regularly. And it's also probably the thing for me that most ends up as a little bit of a smiley face. Yeah, <laughs> almost always. Like there's always like, there always is that mid cut somewhere. There's always a little top end boost, probably after addressing the, the beater attack, like, like you suggested there, which by the way, could be the most like problematic thing with, with your kick drum. So pay really close attention to that. If you're making your own kick drum, that the beater attack isn't just like terribly annoying because <laughs> it, it's really hard to fix that. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah, the the low end. You, I mean, that's the whole that's the whole thing, right? We need that to work. So, got to pay close attention there. I'm similar. I'm kind of addressing something usually on the upper octave of the of like the fundamental. Mm. I'm ducking that around 150 or whatever it happens to be, and then boosting like with a shelf or something if if I can. Sometimes you boost with the shelf, and you're just like, oh, I can. If I add more, it gets worse. But if you can. I go for it. <laughs> to totally. So does that mean you do the cleanup and boosting in one step? Because I specifically... I do. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's different then. Because I do what I just described, only like cleaning those things up usually with something like a fab filter or stock EQ, like some clean digital EQ. It doesn't matter. They're all the same in terms uh -huh. of sound quality. Um, and this is really true, by the way. If you have any sort of digital EQ that doesn't emulate any saturation, analog vibe, whatever... They are all the same. It's literally the same code underneath it. The curves might differ or whatever, but there's no difference in sound quality. So just use whatever you have. But then after that, I will boost with usually a different EQ that is a little more colorful. So I might go for an SSL EQ or for a Pultec or for a knee for something that has not just different curves, but also something where I can't see the curves. I like to just do it by feel and ear. So I like to just have the knobs. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And then also I like the the color of the specific sound of a certain EQ for certain things. So that those are two different steps of the process for me. It doesn't have to, like, not saying you should do it that way, but that just works for me. I kind of subtract very surgically and then boost with rather, like, like very much less precise moves, basically. Cool. Um, are you, just out of curiosity, this is a nerdy question for me. Are you using your SSL? All the time. Like, kind of... Yeah, yeah. So Benny has like an interface that interfaces with like the SSL that plugin. One. Oh, he's holding it up to the camera if you're on YouTube. Yeah. So those knobs map to, <clears throat> sorry, those knobs map to the plugin in Benny's session. So he can like mix as if it's hardware, which is really awesome. It's pretty I, fun. I can even, um, I can even, yeah. if I hit one button here, the virtual SSL console comes up on the screen and covers it entirely. So I don't see the DAW anymore. I just see my channel strips with mm. all the active instances with all the meters going and the view meter for the mix compass compressor. And like, I have just have this SSL in front of me, not even seeing the session. That's and then fun. I just grab knobs and turn it like on an analog cons console. And I love it. And uh, so, yeah. Very yeah, fun. Totally. Very fun. Yeah. So that's what I do. And um, for the, I do, I do it very similarly to what you just described. I will go for a low, uh, like literally a smiley face thing where um, after I got rid of the stuff that I don't want in the low end, I will typically find mm -hmm. either a low shelf or I switch it to the bell and find the fundamental or whatever I like about it and boost that as much as I can in the yep. context of the song. And then I will do the same with the top end. And usually there's, I use two bands for that. I don't know about you, Malcolm. So depending on the genre as well, but like for a lot of modern stuff, I tend to boost pretty high for the kind of typewriter, sort of wet kick drum sound thing a little bit where it's like, it could be 8K, it could be even 10K on some metal stuff or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I have another band usually... If it's more rock, it could be around 1.5 or 2K or something. If it's more metal, it can be 5K or I don't know, but like some upper mid-range band. And I try to balance, they, they, they sound different to me, and I try to find a good balance there to just give it an overall presence boost as broad as, I, as possible so that it is kind of transparent and not annoying, but then also as narrow as I have to be so in order to not boost stuff that I don't want. And yeah, right. so that's what I typically do. So I will clean it up. And then use a colorful EQ to boost top end and boost low end. That's basically it in terms of EQing. And that that just, I think that's a very valuable lesson there for you guys as well, is that I've seen so many people use 15 bands on a kick drum doing all kinds of weird moves. And in, in most cases, it's true for the, both for the two of us, but also for all the other like all like really good mixes that I've seen do their thing. There's not a lot going on usually. It's like, it's a low end boost. It's some kind of presence boost. It's some cleanup in the mid range and the upper part of the bass or whatever. And that's usually it. And and it's it's almost always that kind of smiley curve. It varies based on the genre, whatever, but everyone reaches for kind of the same things for the same 
frequency areas and there's no no need to reinvent the wheel there or no need to create any kind of weird curves with tons of bands. It's always pretty similar. Like how much attack do you want? How much low end do you want? And how much of the mid range that sounds kind of cardboardy, boxy, whatever, how much of that do you want? And you just dial it in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know about you, Benny, but I really find that kick drums really fall apart if you push EQs on them hard at least especially in like the the low end like like if i and and the subtraction of the mids it's just like as soon as you are listening with context and you start really yanking around a kick drum the the relationship with the rest of the mics just deteriorates super quickly and it's like it it just falls apart so it you kind of have to be not i'm not saying be subtle no but i'm just like again, listen in context, and maybe there's another way to get it to do what you want. Exactly. For example, you might get some of that attack off of the it, off of the overheads, or maybe maybe if you mute the overheads, that attack problem goes away, mm-hmm. and so you have to find a balance there. You, you just yeah, I don't find myself going too far with an EQ on a kick drum. I guess is really the the moral of the story. Yeah, I tend to agree. I will go pretty far usually with the the presence with the attack, especially in modern dance yeah, music. The, like that's always the one that surprises me. If you listen solo, you think like, well, that sounds clicky, you know, as hell. <laughs> and like I don't need any any more there. But then you turn on the rest and the kick disappears, and then you find you, yourself having to boost twelve dB or something. So that that yeah. happens. But on the low end especially, I'm totally with you. It's not uncommon for me to just do yeah. one or two dBs of low end boost and that's totally enough. And when in solo, I might think, well, it sounds cool if I boost 10 here, but like in the context yeah, of the mix, it's it, it quickly just, too much. Yeah, it, it can quickly get weird. And the, the way I've been working around this, and it, it's kind of what you do with separating the additive stuff to a different EQ, but I do a similar thing, but usually with some like harmonic kind of, treatment instead like saturation multi-band saturation is kind of how i've been shaping kick drums for the additive stuff more lately especially the Mm -hmm. low end like like max bass that you know old school famous waves plugin i think that's i don't actually know what that thing does but it makes my low end bigger (laughs) that's what it's supposed to do yeah (laughs) yeah and so like that's that's kind of my usual go-to for for figuring out like getting getting more low end squeezed into that kick without using an EQ to do it, or or like some kind of exciter plugin can even be used to get that click thing figured out as well. Like it can just make that area denser and less less harsh. So saturation is kind of my additive EQ move. That's how I think of it anyway. Absolutely, and I'd say let's go into saturation, compression, and that sort of color stuff in the next part of this because mm-hmm. this is really yeah. exciting because this is how I get a lot of the character and yeah, color and vibe and all of that in the kick drum, and I guess you do too. And it's really interesting how all of that serves kind of as EQ in a way too. So yeah, let's let's dive into this. So to wrap this one up, I think, yeah, listen in context, create a balance first, make sure the source is right, do some simple Mm -hmm. intentional EQ moves. And then the last thing maybe to say here is that things like, again, pushing the context thing here, things like the mid-range, for example, you don't know how much of that to get rid of or how problematic it is or whatever if you don't listen to the kick drum with the overheads and the rooms and stuff on. So because a lot of that, if you listen to your rough mix and you feel like it sounds kind of boxy or cheap or like a jam space basement recording, maybe it's not even the kick drum, maybe it is the room that's really loud or maybe it's the overhead or some other mic bleed in another, in another mic or whatever. So you might try. You might be trying to clean up the kick drum without success when the problem is actually on some other microphone or you know that sort of stuff. Or you feel like the kick drum is kind of not really cutting through. You only hear a, a little bit of a low end thump and a little bit of a clicky attack, but it doesn't have like the body length or substance that you want. Maybe just turn up the rooms more or the overheads or EQ those differently. Or maybe you have to low cut all of your EQs. Very common actually that you have to get rid of the low end in the overheads and the rooms so that the actual mm-hmm. good low end of the kick drum can come through. And if both are, or all three of those are together, it's this weird muddy low end, no matter how defined your kick low end actually is, right? So oftentimes I have, so sometimes I, I enjoy um, a lot of low end in rooms in a slow song where I really want the kick to bloom and, you know, but sometimes it's just way too much. Sometimes I have to get rid of everything below 200 or something on the overheads and rooms. And then all of a sudden, the carefully shaped low end of my actual kick drum can come through and and is not being altered and filtered and changed by all the other stuff, right? Because it all works together. Yeah. And the more you EQ, Absolutely. the worse it can get because the phase, phase relationship changes with EQ. That's also another thing. So yeah, context is super important. 
Yeah, yeah. What a great exercise it is just to uh, listen to your drum kit as a whole and then identify what you don't think sounds good. So let's assume it's a kick drum in this case. Now mute your overheads in your room and see if your kick drum sound gets better. And then you've learned, okay, my kick drum's not the problem. It's the relationship between these sets of mics. That's the problem. So do I want to address that by trying to just add more of what I want to the kick drum or by subtracting from the drums that are I'm introducing that are causing a problem? Yeah, totally, totally. And final thing about EQ here, and this is something that I, I said I said it before in a different episode, also so often overlooked and not not talked about enough, is if you have multiple kick drum layers or microphones or samples, you can absolutely clean those up individually or boost things on the individual tracks, but be very careful here because you're introducing another problem. If you are putting together your final kick drum sound that consists of a sample and maybe two microphones or whatever, then you hopefully make sure that the phase is correct, that those samples and mics and all of that work together well and are in phase. Now, if you start EQing one part of that kick drum that you just created, like one layer of it, you change the phase relationship again unless you're using a linear phase EQ, but that introduces other problems. So I wouldn't actually recommend mm -hmm. that. And so what I mean is, what I try to do almost always, if at all possible, I will find a balance between all my kick layers, get them in phase, and then I will do I will EQ them as a whole. So once I have my balance, I view that as my one kick drum sound, and I only treat that. That's my kick drum. No matter how, layers are, how, my, how many layers are involved, I have my one kick drum sort of master group, and I will just EQ that, because that will keep the phase relationship intact and that will ha usually leave you with like better, clearer transients, more punch, less smear. And I will only go into the individual layers if I really have to. And if I do that, I will check the phase again after I did my changes. So if I end up having mm -hmm. to low cut one of the samples or do a drastic EQ move, I will just quickly hit the phase button and see if it's still intact. Um, and I might, sometimes I even have to print it and realign it or something if it drastically changes. But w if at all possible, I try to create a kick drum balance, then I just view that as my one kick drum mic and that's what I EQ. Yeah, that's very good practice. It's hard to hold yourself yeah. to that, but it's good practice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying you have to do that, but I, I, I've seen situations where people really created a messy situation in the low end by EQing five different kick drum layers individually and then wondering why the, the sum doesn't work anymore, right? So... Yeah, yeah. And while this is kind of the, the danger of working backwards, like you kind of alluded to earlier, if you go backwards and change all the decisions you made earlier, you might end up just like with a totally different thing. And it's like, well, you, the problem you tried to fix by changing something also changed everything else. And yeah, they, it's messy and detailed work we do. Yeah, <laughs> totally. All right. Thank you for listening. Let's continue next week with compression, saturation, and that kind of fun stuff. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. See you next week. Thanks.